Hi, uh, my name is Jack Gilbert. It's lovely to be here. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to speak to you today. I'm going to be talking today um, about our work understanding host microbe uh, interactions and in soil systems, um, predominantly focused on how we can translate basic research into agricultural practice. Um, as you'll see here, I'm uh, in the University of California, San Diego, um, which is a wonderful place to live. Um, and I'm in, currently in the Department of Pediatrics and Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is an odd combination, uh, but it refers and relates to uh, my research interests, which are predominantly associated with how to examine how bacteria interact with each other and how they interact with the world around them. Um, my vast majority of my soil systems research obviously comes from work I did when I was at University of Chicago. However, you know, I'm uh, currently exploring how we can apply microbiome research programs uh, to many, many different ecosystems. So to start with, I want to give my quote uh, by Julian Davies, uh, who stipulated, uh, once the diversity of the microbial world is catalogued, it will make astronomy look like a pitiful science, which I, I always love that. If we can make microbiology better than astronomy, that's always a good thing. Um, and it really talks to the fact that there are, you know, one times 10 to the 30 bacteria on the planet. Um, and, uh, you know, we're trying to understand how they all interact and how they work. It's a phenomenally large data science and something we really do need to interact with at scale. Uh, to get at this, we uh, developed a program of research called the Earth Microbiome Project in about 2010. Um, and this is a, a figure, an infographic from our um, uh, 2017 paper, um, which uh, examined the first uh, 25 to 30,000 samples. Um, and it really pointed out uh, the, the uh, vast depth of, of data resources that we could throw at this problem. Um, uh, we currently, this is the first 30,000, we currently have over 150,000 samples in the database and are hoping to update this analysis um, as we move forward. But it is obviously a phenomenal data topic. Some of the things we uncovered were trying to examine uh, the diversity of uh, different microbial ecosystems. And as we showed in that study, soils, sediments and plant roots are among the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. Um, and I show here in the bottom left a, um, a, a vineyard, uh, one of my favourite soil systems, I'm sure is yours as well. Um, um, but it, we also were able to divide up those systems into whether they were associated with the host, i.e. like a plant root, as you can see here in the plant rhizosphere, or whether they were free living, um, i.e. associated with just saline, non-saline or standard soils. Um, and what we uncovered from this is that there's a huge amount of diversity in these individual environments. And one of uh, one of that really uh, one thing that really stood out is the fact that highly diverse ecosystems are um, are sources of bacterial uh, taxa or phylotypes to um, low diverse systems. Um, and you know this is along the lines of Bass Becking's hypothesis, right? The everything is everywhere, but the environment selects. I like to proposition this as everything has the potential to be everywhere, uh, but the environment will select for who will survive and thrive in those individual environments. And so if you have a very high diverse environment with lots of niches and lots of ecosystem structure, um, then that's gonna be continuously supplying uh, microbial uh, organisms or uh, taxa variants to these highly selective environments like a hydrothermal vent or a super saline soil. Um, uh, and, and those environments will select for who will survive and thrive. And um, we can see that when we um, examine the difference between, say, different phylotypes of, uh, or different taxonomic levels of association. So up at the top here, uh, we have uh, different um, genera. So each column is a different genus of bacteria, um, and they're coloured uh, by the proportion of that genus found in different environments. So, so for example, um, you can see in around the middle area, there's a, um, a, 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 a few genera that are predominantly found in sediments, saline sediments, for example. Um, and over here on the right, we can see um, bacteria which are predominantly found in soils, but also found in plants um, and plant rhizosphere. And these are genus genera uh, 
that are um, found in uh, those unique environments. But when we go down to the strain level, to the subspecies level um, of assignment, we start to see a significantly greater level of, of, um, of uh, uh, assignment. So, for example, this big green blob in the middle are um, uh, strains of bacteria which are nearly always found associated with plant rhizosphere, so in the root or on the surface of the root, um, and, uh, and predominantly also a little bit found in the soils surrounding those plants, but they're not really found anywhere else. So uh, the genus category of a microbe is a pretty broad category. Those bugs can be found in water, in so soils, in animals. Um, but when we go down to the subspecies level, we see that refinement. We see that selection that Bass Becking was talking about. And we can really dig down into who's where and what are they doing. Um, when we start to um, use this information, we can leverage it to really start to understand um, how microbes associate with different environments and which ones are important. Uh, working with Noah Fiera from the University of Colorado Boulder uh, back in, uh, this is uh, probably about eight years ago now, we were able to use metagenomics um, and amplicon sequencing to reconstruct the microbial uh, biogeography of the prairie that used to exist across the majority of the Midwest. In the United States. This is the um, picture of the original prairie extent. Now, 98% of that prairie has been eradicated by farming practices, right? So in the late 19th century, due to the expansion um, uh, of the American uh, peoples into um, uh, Native American lands and the eradication um, uh, and devastation of the Native Americans by this population, um, we uh, were able to see complete eradication of that prairie, but some of it still exists. And so if you go into Civil War graveyards or into railway depots um, from the Civil War era, you can actually detect and find um, extant prairie, prairie that hasn't undergone agricultural revolution. Um, and, and when we look in those environments, we uh, can find prairie grasses and bacterial symbionts, which are associated with what would have been the extent of the Great Prairie um, originally. And by extrapolating and interpolating between those individual isolatory points and tying that into local climate variants, we can start to predict the taxonomic and functional uh, distribution of those ecosystems. So for example, here on the left, I have taxonomic diversity across what would have been the um, range of the Great Prairie. And on the right, I have functional gene diversity. And the first thing you can take away is that in the center of that range of prairie grasses, we have very low taxonomic and functional diversity. Um, what, what this suggests to us is that we have uh, a monoculture essentially of prairie grasses, um, which are associated with a very small group of bacterial uh, symbionts or bacterial associated taxa, which are um, very uniquely associated with, with those um, uh, prairie grasses. So in digging down into that, we can uh, start to um, explore who uh, those bacterial types are. And so um, interestingly, the bacteria which dominates that central range of the prairie, uh, the one with the very low diversity, is the Veruca microbia, a phyla, um, which uh, the uh, carbon-loving bacteria. They don't like it when you add a lot of nitrogen. So if you were to come in and agriculturally revolutionize this soil and, and pump, uh, you know, till it up and pump in lots of nitrogen, it's going to select against the Veruca microbia and then select four bacteria which may be more able to survive in a high nitrogen environment. And interestingly, um, working with Noah and his team, we were able to um, uh, assemble a genotype from this metagenomic da data, uh, so a, a metagenome assembled genome, and um, this is uh, back from 2016, and, and then uh, map metagenomic reads from data sets in soils all over the world uh, to this genome to determine uh, what environments this particular organism was associated with. Uh, we named this organism Eudea bactocopius, um, Eudeus uh, meaning of the earth, uh, uh, back to it's a rod, obviously, and copious means it's found everywhere. Um, uh, because when we mapped metagenomic reads back against this genotype, we were able to identify this organism in Table Mountain uh, soils, in uh, obviously our prairie paper, in grasslands around the planet, um, in um, even in uh, Central Park there down in the bottom middle. Um, this was one of the most predominant bacteria associated with grassland sites uh, that hadn't undergone agricultural revolution or which had been reclaimed and no longer had nitrogen fertilizers being added. 
This suggests that this bacteria is uniquely associated with these kinds of prairie grasses all over the world, suggesting some kind of ancient symbiotic relationship. Obviously, there are potential genetic variants of this species um, associated with different parts of the world, but it does suggest a unique association. Interestingly, we can also take some of this metagenomic data from different environments and tie it into climate variants um, like we did with uh, backcasting to an ancient prairie site. But then we can forecast forward into the future. And so in, in this study that we published a few years ago in M Systems, uh, which is the journal I am editor in chief of um, with Josh Ledow and colleagues, uh, we were able to demonstrate quite effectively that the microbial community in soils uh, that we isolate from the Tibetan Plateau or from the North American continent today um, are actually best predicted in terms of their taxonomic uh, functional diversity to microbial, com uh, to, sorry, to climate patterns that existed 20 to 30 years ago. So there's a 20 to 30 year lag between climate and the microbial communities we find in the soils. And that could be due to many factors that we're unable to really answer, but likely due to um, uh, things associated with um, uh, 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 plant responses and soil responses, edaphic responses to changing climates and the degree at which the ecosystem, the biosphere catches up with a changing climate. So in this current particular context, we were able to um, take the microbial community um, today. OK, great. It's tied to climate patterns 20 to 30 years ago. Well, what happens if you took climate today and tried to use that to predict what the microbial community might look like in 20, 30 years? And indeed, when we look at richness, for example, the number of species, we can see significant shifts in the richness of the microbial community across the Tibetan Plateau as the Tibetan Plateau adjusts to the climate change it's seeing uh, currently today um, and we'll see spotty but changing bacterial diversity patterns across the North American and Central American continent um, uh, due to shifts in the microbial biosphere associated with the climate we find today and so while this is virtually impossible to um, uh, 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 um, uh, to uh, validate these models. Um, they are interesting models in helping us to really start to tie together what's going on in the climate uh, with what goes on below ground. And that's obviously very important for agricultural practice because if you want to know if your crops and the microbes that sustain them are going to be around in the particular soils on your farmland um, in uh, 20, 30 years time. So you can um, use these kinds of models to predict what that association might look like and start to dig in and tease apart whether you need to change agricultural soil practices. Um, Talking about microbial symbiosis, we were able to um, uh, build up a, a fundamental map of microbial interactions uh, between bacteria, archaea and fungi um, across a soil system. In this case, we used um, a climate stability system um, across uh, the eastern coast of, the, uh, of China. Um, uh, uh, built into the, uh, the um, uh, forest programs that are present in those particular environments. So we took these 110 soil samples um, from uh, five different climate zones, from the very moist tropical south uh, to the very dry, um, almost tundra-like northern areas. Um, not quite tundra, but you know, uh, uh, boreal forests. And so we were able to examine that microbial interaction across those systems. And we uh, did 16S, um, 18S and ITS sequencing to build up a, uh, a picture of what was going on with the bacteria, the archaea and the eukaryotic populations, particularly fungi. Um, and in here we uh, developed a, um, a network a map uh, uh, examining um, uh, the um, co-occurring co abundance uh, or proportional uh, correlations. And so this map only has correlations which are greater than uh, 0.7, so 70% correlated uh, proportional changes over space. Um, and we have over 66,000 associations between some 4,000 microbial species. Interestingly, 90% of these interactions are globally distributed around um, that climate gradient. So no matter what part of the soil you're in, there are unique associations which are interacting with um, uh, bacteria and fungi, especially in soils, in forests, right? That's, a, that's an ecosystem that has a defined association. Interestingly, though, 10% of them are climate specific. So if you dig down into um, the different climate zones, you're going to find these unique associations. So if climate shifts and that zone shifts, are changing the soil, um, the climate that the soils are going to be associated with, 
you're likely to see those climate specific associations changing first. And so identifying what those are and using that effectively is going to be key. Um, interestingly, we can take this information and we can start to predict how that system is changing. Um, and we, we look at those um, statistical associations and correlations in network space, we can start to see really interesting dynamics. So, for example, um, in the north, we have fewer but stronger relationships between bacteria and fungi. Um, and in the south, we have weaker relationships, i.e. less correlative significance, but there's many more of them. Um, what we uh, tend to think of this is, is a uh, byproduct of moisture availability, right? So in the south, there's lots of moisture. So if you have bacteria and fungi living on a soil grain, um, or especially bacteria and archaea living on a soil grain, um, if there's lots of water in between them and another microbial community living on another soil grain, you can start to see that relationship because they might be able to chemically communicate with microbes on another soil grain. But in the north, where there's no water in that gap, you're really super dependent upon the metabolic relationships between you and your other symbionts living in a biofilm on one soil grain. So you can't have any promiscuous relationships with other microbes living on other soil grains. A hypothesis, but work uh, from Mary Firestone's group at Stanford has really started to demonstrate uh, or she, Berkeley, sorry, <laughs> really started to dig down and identify and demonstrate those associations and, and prove their, um, uh, their validity. Interestingly, um, when we get into agriculture, we can see that agricultural practice has a big impact upon the microbial system. Um, and in this work, where we were working uh, with low input smallholder families and fa farmers in tropical environments, uh, which supports over 900 million people, and uh, the majority of those growers are women, um, we were able to identify that functional capacity of the microbial system can actually be maximized, along with yields of the crops, um, by um, using a rotation system with legumes and a lack of tillage. And, and so by implementing those practices, we can see an increase in diversity, an increase in functional potential of the microbial community and an increase in yields. Um, whereas in use of uh, back, uh, inorganic fertilization into those systems significantly reduces bacterial diversity. Selecting for those microbes uh, that are good at using that nitrogen and growing really fast, but not necessarily beneficial for the plants and the crops individually. Digging into this, um, we wanted to explore uh, what that microbial relationship between the soil and the crop was. And so we dug back into my favorite crop, uh, the wine, the uh, Venus vinifera, uh, uh, Venus vinifera uh, uh, grape vine, um, in this case, Merlot variety. And we, we examined the microbial community um, in the soil, um, in the rhizosphere, in the roots themselves, and then in um, the leaves and the berries and the flowers associated with Vitis vinifera over um, uh, different locations and time. Um, and the takeaway from this was that the uh, different areas, um, here you can see on the left in this graph, soil, root zone and root, below ground communities, and then above ground communities, flowers, grapes and leaves, have very different community profiles. Um, the root system is selective for the microbes um, in the soil that, want, that can colonise for it, colonize the root but then as you go up into the above ground properties you have much more selective pressure leading to very different microbial communities and this um, uh, abundance related network diagram on the right really uh, gets to this point nearly all of the microbes found in those above ground communities um, originated um, from microbes found in the soil so the soil is the major colonization factor for the plant and the bacteria which can colonize into the root are permissible uh, colonization events by the plant uh, then can uh, move through the plant up into the uh, above ground tissues, um, leading uh, to microbial plant associations uh, which uh, likely have significant benefit. Um, and digging into this relationship between the microbial community dynamics of the crop, the soil, and the uh, physical chemical properties, we were able to demonstrate in this study that uh, we just published a few years ago, um, uh, looking at rice paddies across China with my, some of my colleagues there, um, to identify how the microbial community associated with the plant plays, what role it plays in shaping um, the carbon um, or dissolved organic matter and carbon nitrogen content of um, those um, important agricultural systems. 
So we looked across these four main rice growing regions and dug in to really start to understand what the driver was of the microbial community and the dissolved organic matter pools that existed in the rice paddy systems that were supporting agricultural productivity. And the key thing that we took away was the primary driver of the chemical diversity of dissolved organic matter was microbial metabolic potential. So there was that distinct relationship. And interestingly, and maybe expectedly, um, the converse is also true. So the microbial community is, is driven, uh, metabolic potential, that microbial community is predominantly driven by the dissolved organic matter chemical diversity. So therefore it's possible to shape rice productivity by using targeted microbial communities, which can best um, access and um, activate uh, the nutrient content of that dissolved organic matter. So this leads us into the potential translatability of this research. Um, agricultural biostimulants, we're calling them, probiotics, if you will, um, although that has a connotation so which may not be relevant for this. Um, but the problem is soil is rapidly being eroded by non-sustainable agricultural practices, um, using input fertilizers, using tillage, leaving um, soils exposed, is causing a, um, a massive reduction in the fertility and uh, bioavailability of our soils across the planet and that needs to stop. If we want to have good agricultural productivity into the future uh, we're going to need to protect our soils and so there's a huge opportunity in the agricultural biotech space um, to, to have increased crop, crop yields which um, support soils at the same time um, and the only real way to do that um, also, also, also environmental stress systems. We want to be able to protect cropping systems against um, a drought, um, against heat stress, um, against new pests that will um, predominantly occur due to shifting climate ranges. And so the solution is shelf stable. That's always an important thing if you're talking about ag, ag biotech business, organic synergistic consortia of bacteria and fungi uh, that can enable more efficient nutrient use of, uh, of the systems in the soil while um, enabling stabilization of that soil matrix, increasing yield, um, capturing carbon, everything. We want to do everything in the kitchen sink. We want it all to work perfectly, right? Um, one good example of this um, is a company um, I um, have uh, uh, equity in, so uh, I, I won't uh, name the company, but that focuses on the um, green revolution, if you will, um, happening in America right now with the legalization of cannabis production and uh, recreational cannabis use. Um, and in this case, um, uh, we were able to identify a bacterial organism or a group of organisms that are extremely good at making phosphate labile from a labile or non-labile uh, phosphate resources in soil systems and in water systems um, and so uh, you can input fertilizer to create labile phosphate which is taken up by the plant to increase productivity or you can add certain types of microbes which will create a labile phosphate pool associated with um, uh, non-absorbed um, labor um, uh, um, uh, recalcitrant accessibility of phosphate resources in the soil system um, and so using this system, we were able to identify those and increase agricultural productivity of cannabis plants by up to 40%, which I, I won't show here for um, the benefit of the company, but it's a great example of where um, this is now becoming a commercially viable prospect, these microbial biostimulants. Uh, working with another company, Valent Biosciences, um, we were able to demonstrate the addition of mycorrhizal fungal applications to different cropping systems can have a big impact upon crop yields. And so in, in this uh, study, um, which I, I won't identify the location, etc., we were able to demonstrate that the addition of um, mycorrhizal fungal application into um, watermelon cropping systems significantly increases um, yield in those systems over untreated um, environments. And this is this is important. This is all. Everything else is um, stable. Everything else is the same, right? Just the addition of mycorrhizal fungal application into these cropping systems, and those fungi are increasing uh, the resistance of the crops to stress, as well as um, working with the bacterial and archaeal populations in that soil system to make more nutrients bioavailable to the crop um, in order to enhance productivity without the need um, for um, other um, uh, stimulants like uh, um, fertilizers. 
And in here we can see for peanut, for example, we also significantly increase the productivity. But it's not always the same, right? So this is, this is every, uh, each column here is a different cropping system for peanut. And in some systems, uh, we actually got a decrease in yield associated with mycorrhizal fungal application, suggesting that we need to understand more about um, why those didn't work and, and then figure out if there's something else we can add. Some um, feed to keep the fungi alive or some bacteria to help that partnership thrive. Um, interestingly, for corn, uh, we see um, that f um, a micro mycorrhizal fungal application can have a significant improvement. In here, we get a, um, a, a, a significant increase, almost um, uh, uh, 15, um, uh, um, uh, uh, 15 uh, uh, increase in the yield um, of bushels per acre. So 15 bushels per acre um, when we add the microapply under drought conditions. So um, the mycoply really, uh, these mycorrhizal fungal applications really do play a big role in helping the plant to su uh, subsist in drought stress systems. So wrapping up, what do we still need to do? Well, we need to characterize how those bacteria and fungi interact in both the soils and the roots. That's gonna be really important. We also need to identify how to isolate um, and harness consortia with those benefits. And then we need to uh, develop consistent co-production of consortia uh, to reduce production costs. That becomes really important, right? And then ensuring uh, that the product has shelf stability without expensive formulations. If, you, if it's gonna be accessible, it has to be cheap and it has to be stable. And then we need to reduce the grow dependency on fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and get them confident in using this more sustainable practice. Um, and that's not easy, right? Uh, in, in a number of studies that have been going on, I haven't shown those here, um, uh, the, you actually get a, um, a small decrease in the yield of your crop in the first couple of years of turning your fields over to a more sustainable um, bioethical uh, uh, approach uh, to producing these crops. Uh, but interestingly, the cost uh, impact of that reduction in yield is actually um, made negligible by the fact that the farmers stop paying for expensive fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides. So removing um, the cost of, of the dependency on these drugs for agriculture, herbicides, pesticides and fertilizers, you can actually make the system still more profitable even with that initial reduction in yield. However, um, by year three and four, the system is actually becoming uh, yield positive um, over baseline um, due to the fact that the system now has more carbon locked in the soil, there's more uh, bioavailability of nutrients um, and the uh, system becomes more productive. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, this is a picture of our campus at UCSD. Uh, it's a beautiful place to uh, live and work. And uh, if you're interested, please let me know. Uh, thank you to my sponsors. Predominantly our work is in the um, health space. Um, however, uh, obviously with NSF, we do a lot of uh, agricultural and uh, systems work as well. And uh, these are my uh, uh, lab, a uh, fantastic group of uh, brilliant, smart individuals. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, very proud of the work they do. Uh, so thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much for joining us for that wonderful uh, presentation by Professor Jack Gilbert. Um, so if you are just now joining us, um, we just heard from Professor Jack Gilbert um, where we shifted from an earlier uh, microbiome focus in earlier sessions to microbial ecology and interactions specifically between soil microbes and their environments. And we heard um, a small bit about his findings um, from a couple of different projects he's done. Uh, very, very interesting work. Um, especially the, the work on diversity of microbial soil populations and those, those interactions that they've been able to observe. Um, the highlights of this lecture, uh, Professor Gilbert highlighted how interactive these populations are with their surroundings and how they are so influential. And so um, I'd like to really start off the Q&A session by asking you a particular question and then we'll move into our, uh, our uh, audience Q&A. So, you stated that there's a 20 to 30 year lag between climate and microbial communities um, that we're finding in the soil. And so this is likely due to plant and soil responses um, to the changes in climate. So um, you asked and posed the question, what if you took climate today to figure out what the microbial community of soils would look like in 20 to 30 years? So my question is, is yes, what, what, um, how would you like to see that knowledge being leveraged? How would you, where would you like to see that research go in the future? 
I think I think the, the, the biggest use of that kind of research is the opportunity to be able to predict how agricultural systems might shift right over time. So, you know, we know uh, with the changing climate, there'll be changes in where you can plant alfalfa or corn or maize, right? You can you can shift it around as it as it as it uh, as the climate shifts. Um, the the issues are: will that soil be as productive? And as we move into um, a more carbon driven economy, um, you know, carbon sequestration driven economy, um, and we're looking to create healthier soils that have more organic matter in them, then the role of the microbes in 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 that relationship are going to become huge. Right. So it's going to become incredibly important to understand, OK, if I have to move my agricultural productivity up, um, uh, you know, a, a few hundred miles north in order to take advantage of a shifting climate, is the soil bacterial and they're going to actually support um, the, the systems which I'm trying to facilitate. And, and uh, it's going to happen at a governmental level. Um, but it will be it will be important to be able to understand how they're shifting now. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the question that's really hard to answer is what's driving that shift? You know, really, what are the, if we have this 20 to 30 year time lag, uh, what's driving that lag? And, you know, the wonderful thing about doing these kind of modeling exercises is no one can really prove me wrong because they can't travel to the future and find out if I am. Uh, but what we can do is make explicit statements such as, well, um, you know, obviously microbes are very, very fundamentally altered by plant um, and uh, availability of, um, of uh, soil organic matter composition. And therefore, um, if the plants are changing in response to the climate, likely the microbes will as well. And put on top of that, the shifting edaphic variables um, associated with moisture and pH, et cetera, as we see changes in precipitation, you're going to see a shift. Now, uh, teasing apart those interaction dynamics to create something which is reasonable and can provide applied advice to agricultural partners, that becomes much, much harder. I'd say we're at, we're at the stage where we can generate hypotheses. We now need to validate and test them and determine their um, application potential. Mm, very interesting. Thank you. Um, so speaking about the models, we have our first audience question. Uh, Zach Holt is interested in learning about how the model was constructed that you that you spoke about in your presentation. He specifically asked what mathematical formulas or assumptions were made in, in the development. So that might be, it's a pretty specific question. So if you could maybe talk a little bit about it, maybe uh, refer to some resources that would be good for him to check out. <laughs> Sure, Zach. I mean, it's um, I'm the problem with this question and answer format is I'm not entirely sure which model you're referring to because I did speak about a number of different models. But um, uh, what what I'll assume it's the same model as before um, when we're we're predicting those dynamic shifts. Alternatively, it, it could be the uh, a similar style of model where we're kind of trying to predict or hindcast back to eighteen. 40s um, Great Prairie uh, kind of context. And in both those situations, it's a pretty standard linear model, right? Um, uh, we published a number of papers using artificial neural network models, which are, are Bayesian nonlinear models, uh, which rely on Bayesian mathematical formula. These don't. Um, these, are, these are pretty linear associations between climate uh, variables and what kind of organisms are present there, generally at the genera to family level. Um, and so, you know, uh, realistically, um, they're uh, nothing but niche models, uh, so niche genus models, which are very common outside of microbiological literature um, and are used quite often to predict the changing shift variants for trees or for um, animals and, um, and other plants. And so, you know, um, uh, they're, they're pretty uh, standard linear relationships. Um, where it becomes complicated is if, uh, as I mentioned before, with artificial neural networks, if you want to allow um, organisms to interact in your modeling infrastructure, that's when you need conditional dependencies, which can be predicted based upon um, more, more complicated nonlinear equations uh, with you know, various factors that allow for uh, those relationships to be manifest between say, two interacting nodes. Okay, thank you for that. So I'll move on to our next question. Um, Mark is wondering if you have any idea which Panibacillus species you were detecting. Um, and, and Mark, I did see your question earlier, so I had to go back and, and look through the literature. We, we obviously these were um, 16S analyses at the time. And so getting any um, subgenus level uh, assignment, um, it has to be treated with extreme caution. 
Um, the so I can't make a definitive um, and a confident statement about exactly which type of pedibacillus it was. Um, however, uh, you know there are a number of studies that have followed up on on the work that we've done um, using metagenomics in in Vitis vinifera um, uh, soil uh, rhizosphere communities, and so um, it might be interesting to compare and contrast. Uh, those findings with our more uh, primitive amplicon sequencing approaches. So Nikki says that it was very interesting how abundance of microbial species changes from north to south of the east coast of China were noticed in some of your work. Um, she's asking, does urban sanitation urbanization, my apologies, urbanization or pollution from the cities affect the microbiome of these areas. Perhaps it is different in more populated areas versus more rural areas. Could you speak to that at all? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. A, a lot of our a lot of our other work, multiple studies, uh, you know, programs of research that we've done have been involved in the urban um, impacts upon uh, soil systems. And we publish a number of studies on that as, as others have uh, there's been a, a survey of the grasslands, and I mentioned this before, but of Central Park, and uh, which I talked about earlier. Um, but also, you know, we've done uh, urban grasslands and, and forest systems in the Chicago area when I used to live there. Um, uh, however, you know, the impact of pollution and urbanization is very, very hard to manifest. We actually have a paper about to come out in M Systems Journal, which is uh, the journal I run. Um, where we examined uh, rice paddy systems across China. Um, and I, I did, I, I maybe, I actually talked a little bit about that, but I didn't, yeah, the rice paddy microbiome work. But what I haven't done, what I didn't say in this presentation, was that um, when the rice paddies were uh, around urbanized areas, we looked at the rice paddy microbiome and the local um, soil systems which were prevalent in the areas surrounding the rice paddy systems, right? So these are non agricultural systems right probably still managed most of that land has been managed by humans for you know ten thousand years or more but um uh, uh, less out, up to agriculture now the uh, um, there's a weak um uh, but significant relationship between the degree of urbanization around those non um selective uh, non-agricultural systems um that are um that suggest that local urbanization could be uh, playing a key factor in shaping what microbes are present there but um as i'm sure you're aware the multifactorial nature of urbanization makes it incredibly difficult to determine exactly which factors of urbanization are playing a role right is it air pollution is it uh, local climate variance due to uh, you know these heat um, uh, the pockets which pop up around urban environments is it is it uh, water runoff from you know non-porous uh, uh, surface materials uh, we just don't know and, it, and this is a really interesting point right urban environments have been given a huge amount of um, data driven information because people want to run cities they want to manage cities and to do that you need data right so there's a huge amount of data but a lot of that data is not available Right, so it's very, very difficult to get the data you require in order to um, study the independent and dependent variables that might be influencing microbial communities because uh, the data is locked up in city archives or in governmental bodies that aren't making it publicly available. Um, or it's available, but it's not available in a way that we can readily, without massive, you know, very time consuming curation efforts make available to our uh, bioinformaticians in order to run those kind of analyses. So there's a there's a gap between uh, the availability of data and what we can how we can use it to infer variants um, in how micros might be responding to those particular parameters. And you know, so this is a problem for all of our science, right? You know, uh, what we would refer to as metadata, the, the data which we can use to uh, understand trends in microbial communities. It's just woefully unavailable, inaccurate or uncurated. Um, and there needs to be a much bigger drive towards doing that if we're going to really uh, realize the full potential of the application and translation of this basic science into something which can be used in practice. Thank you. That was a really thorough answer. You were able to give a lot more extra information uh, than what was able to be included in your presentation. So that was fantastic. Um, another question is, if you reckon that autotrophic str strains 
may contribute to the increase in plant yield in the field. Oh, autotrophic or oxytrophic? I didn't, I didn't autotrophic. Read the... autotrophic. Oh, okay. Huh. That's a really interesting question. I hadn't really considered that. Um, yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, uh, it would be very interesting to examine that in the lab. I haven't seen any data necessarily that would enable me to really uh, tease that apart um, uh, in the field, right? In a in a contextual framework, and uh, honestly, I haven't looked. Um, I, I, you know, I know there are epiphytic uh, cyanobacteria which um, uh, cover most leaf systems um, globally, and we we found those in um, in our Vitis vinifera work and in um, forest uh, system work, which I haven't talked about today. And they do show uh, regional trends. So, for example, with altitude, you see shifts in the types of cyanobacteria. But I would have assumed, and this is an assumption, that those cyanobacteria are more parasitic, as it were. They're just living on a surface that uh, provides available moisture and, and uh, light. Um, it, whether they're actually playing a role in managing the productivity of, of a, a host plant um, is very interesting. I just don't know the literature in that area, and so I can't answer the question. That's a really good question and uh, definitely one we should be answering. Yeah, very good food for thought. Um, so another question is uh, regarding some future research. So how you would recommend approaching going further to understand the relations between the bacteria uh, and with the fungi? So what we're doing, um, um, very clever colleagues of mine up at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, built a, a system that enables us to grow um, even complex trees and you know complex plant systems um, in a in a pattern that allows us to visualize um, microbial um, so bacterial fungal archaeal um, and root uh, symbioses um, commensal relationships right so you know the whole gambit um, and these these systems we're currently applying um, uh, in uh, to examine the system in mangrove forests because we have a new program of research with uh, multiple people in the lab focused on restoring mangroves, right? And there's been a fair amount of work on this in Brazil, um, where there's a lot of interest in this space um, with Alexandre Rosado. But the, um, the, 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 the key point there is what we're able to do in these systems is take them into the lab, do mono uh, association studies, do uh, dye association studies, where we take a fungus and a bacteria, or um, you know, uh, six bacteria, no fungus. You know, we, can, we can do um, um, uh, like xenic, uh, true axenic um, association studies to allow us to determine the roles of particular microbes and how they interact. And so in that, we're taking um, uh, our, uh, mycorrhizal fungal systems and combining those mycorrhizal fungi with particular types of bacteria, which we know uh, produce auxins to promote, promote plant growth, our nitrogen fixers, that's great, right? Like, like penibacillus that we heard before is a good nitrogen fixer, um, that you know can do um, particular processes which we know are of relevance. Um, and this is helping a lot. A lot of this is actual agricultural research practice, which I mentioned in the talk, feeding back into the basic science we do in the lab and saying, OK, uh, you know, enough of these field studies where we're observing trends. Let's bring it back in and engineer these organisms to do what we want them to do. And that's really the, the forefront of applied science. Um, so, uh, you know, taking um, our vascular mycorrhizal fungi, mycorrhizal fungi more generally, um, and placing them in systems where we uh, co-associate them with different types of bacteria to determine response, that's the bit I'm most interested in. And I think that's the future where we're able to uh, define, create defined communities uh, that have uh, particular purposes, um, not just for agriculture, but for enabling us to disentangle the communication network which supports plant growth or uh, is detrimental to plant growth. And so we can really um, uh, you know, um, do something with it. All right, so we have two more questions. So we'll try to address those quickly and, and let everybody get on. Um, so we're going back to your climate models. Um, and someone is wondering um, if in these models, you accounted for the changes in land use and how that was accounted for. Yeah, that I, this comes back to the previous question about urbanization, right? Data availability. Interestingly, um, for the uh, Tibetan Plateau, did I mention the Tibetan Plateau? I think I did. Sorry, I recorded this lecture a few, um, a few yes, weeks you, ago. Yes, you did mention it. Yes. yes. 
So for the Tibetan Plateau, we actually have some pretty good records. Um, when when China annexed uh, the Tibetan Plateau um, back in the uh, 60s or 70s, there was a as a push there to um, actually understand how land was being used in the system. And so we actually have reasonably good records about the transference of land into agricultural productivity, um, or, you know, away from uh, more wild type systems. Um, and interestingly, there, yes, we can actually see that um, as you if you if you um, examine changes over the say the last hundred years, you can see shifts towards uh, more nitrogen uh, dependent organisms away from um, you know things like uh, Udea bacta, which don't like um, uh, uh, lo- they don't like lots of nitrogen. They they like lots of carbon. They look high, prefer a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, we see a shift when you turn over to agricultural practice towards microbes which are more nitrogen dependent or would prefer a higher nitrogen content. So more. Um, uh, K selected species uh, shifting uh, to our selected species and vice versa. So that relationship um, it can actually be uh, passed out. Now, obviously, our, um, our, we're interpolating between observed data points and then trying to uh, back, back uh, predict and fore predict in order to actually make some significant uh, impacts upon what that system is actually able to tell us. So it's it's very interesting if you can do that, right? Um, but tying it into actually into proper, um, as you were, um, proper uh, uh, efforts to really understand how that system is changing with land use will take much more detailed um, uh, examination of those particular factors, right? We can't just say, or oh, you know, um, it's turned over to agriculture and stuff has changed so many more variables taken into consideration land use activity uh, that we can't predict in this particular system. Okay, so our last question um, is what is from one of our previous speakers, um, wondering if you've ever encountered Candidatus liberibacter asiaticus living in soil or other environments outside of its host or citrus trees. Oh, that's a really good question. I, I haven't, Daniel, um, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, you know, I, not that I haven't tried to look, as it were, but we, we had never been focused on uh, Liberobacter asiaticus. So it's never been a particular organism that we've, um, we've uh, adjusted to uh, our, uh, or used our data in order to investigate. But it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, and one, I'm pretty sure with the amount of data and metadata we actually have about these systems, we could actually go back and examine that. It would just be um, searching through the data resources. And this is a call for freedom of data access, right? And data access with appropriate metadata. Um, tomorrow, I'll be doing a large series for NSF and uh, NIH and DOE, uh, the funding agencies in the US where we um, we literally asking the question, what if you could access all of the microbiome data on the planet? So metagenomes, genomes, uh, amplicon sequencing data. And, I, and my, my initial response to that is, well, it'd be lovely to have that data, but without you know knowing where the sequences came from, how they were extracted, how they were generated, not, not knowing you know what the edaphic variables were associated with those uh, the samples when they were taken or which host species they were associated with, the data is essentially um, just a big fishing expedition. There's there's no real targeted analysis that can be done. Um, and so, you know, for these kinds of studies, if we wanted to examine the um, association of, of uh, this particular candidatus organism across citrus trees, we'd need to be able to dig down into our data sets and determine that citrus trees had actually been um, un- under, you know, catalogued and assessed in this system. Without that, it would become incredibly difficult to really understand if they were important. Sorry, I have a soapbox around freedom of data and metadata that I will stand on and rant about for a very long period of time. But it, what, that's, you know, that's all of the data all right. that we have, <laughs> so all the data we have is available in Cheetah, Q-I-I-T-A, uh, which is a public access database where you can download the entire Earth Microbiome Project study and ton, you know, thousands and thousands of metagenomes and bacterial genomes as well. We appreciate getting to hear some of your soapboxes. That's great. Um, so. On behalf of everybody and all the comments in the in the chat, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I think I failed to introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Acuff, Assistant Professor of Food Microbiology at the University of Arkansas. And I thank you for the wonderful presentation, Professor Gilbert, and um, I thank SFAM for their incredible uh, 
uh, organization um, and technical uh, support on this, uh, this great session. So please join us for the rest of the week uh, and uh, don't hesitate to reach out to any of our speakers with additional questions.